Hello and welcome to everybody to Sustainable Composites the Future. Um, my name is Professor Steve Eichhorn, I'm from the University of Bristol and the Bristol Composites Institute and I'm delighted to be able to uh, bring to you our final session of the week. Uh, we've been with you all week uh, looking at sustainable composites. I hope those of you who've been with us all week have enjoyed the session so far and those of you who are joining us for the first time today you're most welcome. Uh, this uh, session is um, in two parts. We have uh, some speakers this, um, this afternoon first, and then uh, later on this afternoon, we have a workshop as well. And there's a separate link for the workshop for those of you who've registered to attend the workshop, but I really encourage you to come and join us for that. Um, the organisation of this event has been a collaborative effort between two University of Bristol Institutes, the Bristol Composites Institute, and the Cabot Institute for the Environment and also the National Composites Centre. We had expected to run this as a, an in-person event but we decided to go online and I think it's been successful in that respect and we've been delighted with the response. We've had over 300 people registered to attend over the week. Um, we're not anticipating any technical problems but uh, this is the first time we've run an event like this so do please bear with us. Um, we've had a few technical glitches in the week but nothing too serious so far. Um, but everything's live streaming on YouTube, so um, if you can't actually get into Zoom or you have problems with your Zoom connection, then do go to YouTube and you'll be able to see a live connection there. Those of you who are uh, tweeting and using social media, please use uh, the hashtag at the bottom of the holding slide just here, hashtag Sustainable Composites 2020. Um, I'm afraid we've had a cancellation uh, for today's session. Uh, unfortunately, Nadim Zahai, the MP, Minister for Business and Industry, has not been able to uh, join us uh, this time. Uh, but we do have Richard Oldfield, the Chief Executive of the National Composite Centre, and Jade Nicholson, who's the Director for the Research Base of EPSRC, plus Zakir McKenzie, who's a former Green and Black Ambassador, joining us today to give us some talks. And um, as I said later on, we've got our workshop. Now, in order to ask questions, uh, there's an opportunity um, after each speaker to ask questions. We are using the Q&A uh, uh, function in Zoom. So please put your questions to speakers through the Q&A. After each speaker has given their talk, I will uh, pick some questions. Um, note also that you can actually um, vote for questions. So if you see a question in the Q&A feed that you particularly want to be asked, then you can, you can upvote the uh, questions and I will um, ask those questions on your behalf. Um, we are recording the session and actually the, the live streams will be available on our um, uh, website, so the, the web address uh, within the Cabot uh, Institute. And so you'll be able to see those later if you, if you want to go back and see what, what was said. So, um, without further ado, I am going to now uh, introduce our first speaker, um, and I am delighted to be able to introduce uh, Richard Oldfield. He's uh, Chief Executive of the National Composites Centre, which is a subsidiary of the University of Bristol. Um, he was previously Senior Vice President for Business Development and Strategy at GKN Aerospace, and he's held a number of senior positions in companies including Advanced Metallic Technologies and Airbus. We're delighted to have Richard with us, and he's going to now say a few words about uh, sustainable composites and where National Composite Centre fit in with that. So over to you, Richard. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Richard Oldfield. I'm the CEO of the NCC and have been for the last um, couple of years, and it's my pleasure to be joining you this afternoon. Um, like Steve, I was hoping to be able to thank the minister um, but as Steve mentioned, he's been unfortunately called away. Um, so, uh, so I'll carry on with, uh, with what I wanted to say. Um, I'm also delighted that today we are announcing uh, the Sustainable Composites Partnership between the National Composites Centre and the Centre for Process Industries, one of our sister centres in the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult. And we hope this will be a really important step in expanding the activities and partnerships on this critical topic that's been discussed uh, throughout the week. As Hugh Brady outlined at the start of the seminar, sustainability is a top priority for the university and it's great to see the institutes and subsidiaries coming together this, to host this week. 
And I'd just like on behalf of everybody to thank all of the other external speakers who've given their time um, and insights to make this a very thought provoking and enjoyable week. So from our perspective, sustainable composites have a key role to play in delivering the net zero future, creating energy and resource efficient buildings and infrastructure where the benefits of composites can be truly exploited. And the development of the hydrogen system and defining the future of mobility. So new solutions for cars, aircraft, buses, trains, ships, etc. And in addition, composites are allowing us to continue pushing the boundaries of endeavor to unlock the harshest environments of our planet and explore the universe. But ultimately, this can only happen if we continue to find sustainable solutions for the full life cycle of composite applications. It's no longer enough to improve the performance of a product during its usable life. We now need to consider how it was made and what we will do with it at the end. And at the NCC, we call this sustainability cubed i.e. developing solutions that work in all three parts of the life cycle, their creation, their use, and their end of life. And in truth, this is the biggest threat and the biggest opportunity facing the composites industry and the industries that rely on composite materials for their products. How long will it be before we see expanded le legislation to demand that a more comprehensive life cycle solutions are in place? And more importantly, it's our moral obligation to future generations to find solutions to protect the planet for all of our futures. And by developing meaningful, cost efficient life cycle solutions, composites have the opportunity to both transform many sectors and deliver the products that will truly enable a net zero and sustainable future. But doing nothing will mean that the use of composites is increasingly marginalized as more sustainable full life cycle alternatives are found. And at the NCC, we're seeing a marked transformation from our customers who are focusing on the full life cycle consideration for their products, continuing to push uh, composite solutions to improve the operational performance of their products, but also to consider proper end of life solutions and look for alternative ways of processing the materials. The use of recycled materials is increasing and cross-sector solutions here are critical, with one sector's waste material being another sector's input material. And this is especially important for composites where there can be a real life extension of the usable life of the material if we can find cross-sector solutions. And finally, looking far more proactively to the, the development of innovative new materials and new material recovery technologies to improve the total life cycle model. As engineers, we're constantly looking for problems to solve, and we've reached a juncture where we have a huge problem that needs real transformation. Just as in the early development of composite materials over 50 years ago, we could not imagine how they could have transformed our world, allowing us to fly further and cleaner, generating huge amounts of renewable energy, creating buildings and infrastructure that were simply impossible before, and transforming sporting leisure and healthcare products. We now need to invent the next generation of composites, sustainable composites, and we hope that this week acts as a catalyst to driving this forward. I'd just like to thank you all again for attending. I hope you've had an enjoyable and thought provoking few days, and I'll hand back to Steve now for the final session of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Richard. Um, are you able to take some questions at all? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so do put your questions through on the Q&A feed. Um, I've got one here um, from Ian Bevis. As industry hit hard by COVID-19 hopefully moves into a post-pandemic period, how should the government contribute to enable industry and academia to achieve composite sustainability? And when do you think this will be forthcoming? I guess this, is, this might have been better put towards the minister, but um, I don't know if you've got any, any views on that at all. Yeah, well, I think it's different sector by sector, to be honest, and I think the challenges are different sector by sector, but by, but by encouraging the development of sustainable solutions, I think it naturally, it, it naturally forces the industry, it forces um, the academic institutions, it forces organisations like my own to focus on developing those, those solutions. I mean, I think ultimately this will be driven by market demand, it will be driven by legislation, it will be driven by finance. Um, and it needs a combination of those things coming together um, 
ultimately to deliver the change that we need. But I think there's really there's really promising signs. I think there's there's really promising signs in 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 the um, in the type of programs that are being considered going forward. Um, and I think there's a there's a really great opportunity for composites to play its part in that. Um, um, and I think it will come sooner than we think. Um, I think I think it won't be a short term transformation. I think it will happen quickly. And I think COVID will have accelerated that. What uh, question, this is a question for me, what do you think, Rich, are the biggest challenges as far as sustainable composite materials are concerned, given that we've got to increase manufacturing speeds to be competitive with other material processes and manufacturing processes? You know, what, 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 do, you think, what do you think the big challenges are? So I think, I think the biggest challenge for composites period is the economics. Um, I think I think the economics have to work because it, it's it's no good to you know to deliver significant benefits if if actually you know the business case or the economics don't work uh, and that's always been a challenge uh, for composites um, particularly as they get applied in, into you know lower and lower cost applications so I think um, I think we both need a technical solution and we need an economic solution um, to that. We've really got to find a way to break the, uh, you know, break the barriers on that, and really look for real step changes and step changes and transformation. Okay. I think we, I think composites have quite often been seeking the sort of holy grail of performance above and beyond necessarily achieving that balance of performance, uh, performance and economics. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard. That's been very helpful. Um, I think we'll move on now to the, our next speaker, um, uh, Jane Nicholson. So uh, perhaps if you turn your camera off and microphone off now, then we can load up the speaker. Um, and obviously later on, there might be some more questions coming through specifically that you could, be, you could answer. So at the end of the session, we'll probably come back to you. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Jane Nicholson is the director of the research base at EPSRC. Um, this role includes oversight of EPSRC's investments in research and the core disciplines such as engineering, physical sciences, ICT and maths, research infrastructure and its investment in support of people. Uh, Jane has got a vast experience of, of research in the UK and um, she's specifically going to talk to us about uh, this, this area of research and uh, we look forward to hearing her thoughts on the matter. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen as I have a couple of uh, slides to... So hopefully you can um, uh, see the slides now. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you. And I hear that everyone's had a very interesting week looking at very different aspects of sustainable composites. Um, as said in the introduction, I'm Jane Nicholson. I'm director of research base um, at EPSRC and uh, oversee our investment in lots of core disciplines, people and infrastructure. What I like to call the kind of three key ingredients you need for a great research base within the UK. So I'm just going to touch on a bit about what's our current support for the composite space and how sustainable is that, how much sustainability is built into that. Perhaps identify where I feel there's some of the opportunities and then um, particularly perhaps for those engaging in the workshop session later today, talk about how you can feed into EPS or C with any um, ideas that come forward from either that workshop, but maybe discussions across the week about areas we should be considering for investment from a research perspective um, as we go forward. So EPS or C obviously covers a wide range of activities, has a very large portfolio, but if we drill down and look at um, the uh, specific support that we have in the composites area, um, if we just look for what we categorise as composites research, um, about 73 grants out of maybe a total portfolio of say two and a half thousand um, come up that have some relationship to composites. So the total value of that investment is about 100 and uh, 50 uh, million. 
Um, and uh, uh, 50 million of that is directly recorded to um, uh, composites research. But this does cover a huge breadth of what you might call composites. So it covers um, uh, those that you would expect to kind of see if you talk about composites. So applica application areas such as in aerospace, um, construction, automotive, uh, but also picks up um, uh, advanced textile opportunities obviously a wide range of manufacturing applications, um, but also healthcare. And so they range from being the healthcare is a nano composite application you can put in for a sensor um, uh, through to the things you normally think about when you hear about composites. Um, and as with materials research in general, we're seeing a greater consideration of how materials can provide both structural and functional properties at the same time. So there's a certainly an interesting pro uh, project looking at how you can build um, energy storage capabilities into composites um, to use, uh, obviously, in that uh, space. But how much of that portfolio is focused on sustainability? Um, well, actually, using a very crude technique of analysing um, uh, that activity uh, was just looking for well, how many of those projects actually have sustainability or a word associated with that in their title. And you come up with actually there's four projects at the moment that clearly have a direct link with looking at how can you make composites more sustainable. So these are looking at maybe how you can um, develop self healing capabilities with them. Um, sustainable routes to making the next generation of composites, using cellulose to replace glass fibre within composite technology, and thinking about composites, as Richard's just said, composites through their whole life um, uh, type space. So there's definitely great thinking already starting in the academic base about how you can bring in those sustainability concerns. But most probably as we go forward, there's space for there to be more consideration of that contribution um, that's made to sustainability. So what is the kind of opportunity space? What can composites do to help support a future sustainable society? Um, and I think this is some of the things I'd encourage people to think about is what are the contributions sustainable composites can make to um, the government agenda to build back better after the current crisis that we're in? Um, how does uh, composites can con contribute to maybe helping meet decarbonisation targets and the overall net zero by 2050 type targets? And so looking at what are the particular kind of opportunities and challenges that come out of this is clearly composites can enable you to lightweight materials for transport for other application areas. Um, they can uh, look at um, how you might be able to use resources more efficiently and effectively because you can make both the material and the component you make in one stage. Can you reduce waste? Can you look to deliver structure and function together, make it more efficient? Um, in the, the production of the end product um, from how you do that. Um, but very much as Richard said, it's all about the circular economy. How do we make sure that the base materials are sustainable um, and accessible to um, in a global market? Uh, how do you make sure that these things are, can either self-heal or can be repaired? Um, uh, what is the approach to recycling uh, composites, particularly when you're mixing together a lot of different material types? Um, and how do you deal with end of life? So we've had a, a programme as beginning looking at a circular economy in the widest sense, very much looking at the whole end to end in product development. Um, I think to date that hasn't had a, a particular focus on uh, uh, composites, but kind of what is the key challenges um, that we should be addressing to make sure that uh, composites can be used in a way that meets um, uh, this wider agenda of ensuring that what we use is sustainable. And I'm sure there's many other opportunities and challenges, and I think uh, I would put the floor open to, to those attending this to think about what they are and discuss them um, and to try and identify what are the key things that we need to be doing in a research base now to enable um, composites to be able to go forward and kind of make a, a, the contribution they could make into um, uh, the, the sustainable world we need to kind of move into uh, increasingly kind of more and faster. So the last thing I wanted to touch on was uh, the um, route for proposing what might be the next research opportunity. So obviously for any uh, attendee who's from academia, you if you have an idea coming out of these discussions that you think, oh, actually, this is where I'd like to go, you can come forward with an individual research programme. 
but also with an EPSRC, we have an approach which uh, we call the big ideas process, where if there's a collective view from a community, then actually here's a real opportunity space to do some really innovative um, research to be able to take forward a whole domain or a particular challenge. Um, there is a process for people being able to put forward uh, what we call a big idea. Um, and we'll consider that as an area to see whether there is something we should start to build um, a larger program. So these are, uh, to be a big idea, you're bigger than one research proposal, um, but it's very much, is there a particular challenge that community needs to come together? Um, and this can be a way we can then look to see how we can support that. So we review big ideas um, with a panel of experts and then decide which ones we can take forward. We'll look to develop it with the community to make it into something which is say bid ready. So when there's fiscal events or other opportunities to identify funding, we've got a good portfolio of really great ideas um, to be able to take that forward. So I certainly think that's something to bear in mind, particularly I think as you go into the workshop session for those attending that, um, to if something comes up, there is a route for you to share back with us, for us to then think about, certainly from the research aspects, what are the things we should be thinking about funding over the next few years? Um, and how can we then present those to um, uh, our funders, um, government, uh, so that they can then see what they wish to invest in? Uh, and then we can work with the community to take that forward. So that's covered um, the, the aspects I wanted to uh, uh, address with you. Um, and I think very much in that we, we fund quite a lot of composites work, but is it sustain, is there enough sustainability built into that? Um, I'm sure there's more than those four projects I could easily identify by their titles. Um, but actually, really, we want to see that whole portfolio evolve to thinking about the sustainability issues that Richard so clearly identified in his early talk um, uh, for that. And hopefully I've identified a way that if you do come up with kind of community based ideas, you can feed them into us for future consideration. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got so got a. If you're happy to take questions, um, I've got a question here. Um, how can industry play a bigger role in helping to scope research? How feasible would it be to link EPSRC projects to higher tier L funded projects, APC in brackets, and make that journey more seamless? That's a, um, a message from Henry Sale Cook, Sarrell Cook. So um, certainly in scoping out areas, we're really interested in making sure there's kind of co-creation between the academic base and industry um, uh, for that. So on uh, many of our advisory bodies, we have industrialists as well as academics. So there's ways to get involved. And if an area came forward in composites, identifying that you're interested in helping scope that out um, uh, uh, would really be welcomed. Uh, for that because we want to make sure though we focus on doing the early stages of research we want it to be able to be relevant to move on to um, uh, application and use um, in whatever is the most appropriate way for that research um, and then we also work um, within UKRI with our partners so particularly Innovate UK is another way where we can look to build the linkage so that we will be focusing on that early stage research, but there's ways to be able to bring in uh, support and funding for maybe next stage projects, which would more naturally sit um, with Innovate's UK's portfolio. And then maybe the third opportunity space where we have done activities is we have a scheme called Prosperity Partnerships, which is just going through its fourth round of activity now. And I think we would hope we would continue to do this in the future. And this is where, um, uh, industry co-creates a proposal, generally of a generous size, um, with academia, um, and they put in half the funding and we put in half the funding. So there, obviously, you can make sure that there's some uh, university-based research going on, but also it can feed directly into industrial processes. So there's a number of ways that we can bring together both those who will be the end user of the research with formatting what the key part of the research is, um, but still that we would focus on financially supporting that early stage research. Okay, thank you. Uh, hopefully that's answered your question, Henry. Um, I've got a question here from Claire Thresher. Um, um, how does this fit with the recent government funding announcements uh, with respect to the R&D roadmap that have just been announced? So um, the R&D roadmap, 
uh, you may have seen came out on Wednesday. Um, uh, and this is a new kind of government document. Um, and I think uh, while there were um, one or two uh, financial announcements with it, it's actually really an opportunity for I think everyone on this um, uh, seminar to have a look because it poses questions. So it's a chance to influence actually what is the future government uh, agenda, what they should do. So though it talks through what it thinks are the important issues, it doesn't necessarily set um, the definitive actions to be taken, but poses those questions out, um, I think both for academia and industry um, and the third sector to be able to respond to, to help kind of drive forward where how the government should take research and innovation forward. I think some of the real positives from the document is um, uh, it reinforces the requirement to have a strong focus on discovery research um, as well as applied research. Um, the importance of actually uh, attracting great people from all parts of society into the research base um, uh, at all stages of their career so that people can uh, um, move around between academia and industry uh, through their careers as much as obviously attracting the next generation to come in. Um, and also I think reinforces government's commitment to actually the key role research and innovation can make to overall kind of prosperity. Certainly we've seen the key role that um, research and innovation inputs made into the current crisis um, uh, and it, they reinforce such the importance of having a strong research base um, and innovation space um, uh, for that. Um, but I'd advise everyone to have a look at it. I think if you, if you search R&D um, uh, roadmap, um, uh, hopefully in Google, it would come up. Um, but there are a number of questions uh, that are raised, which I think is an opportunity for everyone to feed in what they think um, for government to consider. Um, I've got one final question here. It's from a colleague of mine, Ian Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Jane. The Hyperdiff project that you mentioned in your presentation has arisen from EPSRC funding. It's twice over, actually, from the program grant and responsive node, uh, for which we're very grateful. Uh, we're keen to embed this technique within NCC, CPI, and ultimately the wider composites industry. Is a logical next step innovate funding from UKRI? Um, it could be. Um, obviously, it depends on the specifics of what you want to do, um, but certainly uh, uh, it would innovate generally fund the company. Um, so it would be depend on how you take that forward um, uh, for that activity. If it's a small scale activity that you want to do to kind of move it on from the research to um, a bit more of a demonstrator so you can share it out through the NCC, uh, NCC contacts or with other companies, maybe impact acceleration account funding that might be available within your university could be another route to be able to do that kind of add on bit of activity that you might need to take what is a hopefully a great research result and just turn it into something which um, obviously is easier to project to a company so they can see what they could use it for. Thank you very much and that's that's very helpful thank you. Um, okay well um, thank you for that it's, it's, it's really important that we hear the voice of the funding council and uh, we're very glad to have you here I hope you stick around with us today and hear some of the thoughts of our delegates particularly in the workshop so thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to our next speaker, um, uh, Zakir McKenzie. Um, uh, Zakir McKenzie is a green leader, writer, broadcaster and researcher. As a former green and black, uh, black and green ambassador, Zakir is widely recognised for her leadership in driving inclusion in Bristol's sustainability movement and her successes have paved the way for nine new ambassadors from minoritised groups to develop their own leadership potential under a new national lottery scheme. Um, as a writer, she took on a residency with Forestry England. As a broadcaster, she features regularly on Ajima Radio. And as a researcher, she is focused on the economic, environmental and social implications of ExxonMobil's Guyana Petroleum Find, as well as journalism in the UK after Empire Windrush. Now, in my talk on Monday, if you, if you were there, I mentioned the importance of addressing sustainability from multiple angles. And uh, we've asked Zakir to attend this conference and listen in. So she's been with us all week and to offer today a provocation to us all based on her expertise in social and environmental justice on how we might be able to raise the ambitions in sustainable composites. Now, the brief to her was to be challenging and we haven't actually imposed any constraints on how Zakir delivers this message. So we look forward to hearing her views and I hope you'll be receptive to learning where we can collectively raise the bar. 
So over to you, Zakia. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for actually having me, um, you know, come here and, and deliver a provocation. So uh, the brief was to do anything. I'm kind of going to speak to the, uh, my give my response on what I've heard over the past few days and what it was to me before, what it is to me now um, in the aftermath, and then uh, things I would probably ask you guys about what it is and how it is uh, you're gonna continue and carry on your work um, with an ear and an eye to what is actually happening in people's lives every day, right? So when Haley came to Jaz Jasmine and I, so Jasmine Ketibor Foley, who is who was the other uh, black and green ambassador with myself, I had no clue, absolutely none, what sustainable composites were. And so when I got the brief, I didn't, you know, I said, and this is pre-COVID, I said, you know, I wouldn't be interested. Jasmine was interested. Now I'm just gonna tell you, no, it still makes no sense to me, but Jasmine was interested because she had been starting to make sculptures using biomaterial, which was a substrate inoculated with mycelium um, and trying to read on how it could make for an art project, right? So that's what Jasmine was doing um, and, and somehow recognize it was similar to what Haley was asking for us in terms of coming and, and having an idea or having a say on sustainable composites as this very big thing, big industry that uh, you guys work with, right? So this was, I had no clue. And so of course, the first thing I did was went online and I went into Google and, you know, tried to look up what it was to begin with. And I mean, I will say that you guys are in a very niche, niche place, a very niche industry because not even Google could have, you know, there wasn't a fight minute click and read uh, uh, two lines that I could find what uh, sustainable composites were as it is as we're talking about here um, and I mean that's usually what would happen with something that is you know anything you want to find you go online you click you should find it on the first page you can find out what it was most of the it took me you know uh, maybe three or four page clicks to actually get an idea of what we were talking about and most of these pages were industry, um, you know, academics. I suppose the people who are here with us today, so industry, academics, institution, you know, funds, that type of thing. Um, and so for me, it was very interesting to begin with because this is, it sounds like to me, a very interesting thing, but it also means that sustainable composites, as we've been hearing, over this week hasn't crossed over into what is kind of mainstream activism and mainstream uh, environmental justice debate and climate debate, right? We haven't been speaking about it. We just don't know what it is. Um, and I think while people obviously know about it because you all are here and there is an industry and of course we are using, you know, I recognize that actually we are using uh, materials that are sustainable composites every day and around us and taking an airplane or you know whatever it is that we do we're probably encountering a lot of this stuff it isn't that we and especially because we have an ear to sustainability right that, that word we kind of understand what we don't understand is the composites like composite of what first of all composite of what and composite why why are we doing that and i think you know that's what we've what what i have found discussed over these past few days that now i can understand a bit more and I mean it's not like I understood a lot the first day was pretty good it was in it, um introductions and kind of you know the questions the Q&A on the first day was really helpful for me to get, kind of do a bit more research and look up um you know other other things that people had asked to understand um and then the, when the sessions that especially spoke about recycling again the sessions that were focused on recycling and the sustainability aspect of it i think again were really good for me to uh to, to, to pay attention to keep interested right because and, and i think there's no problem with that because it is not my focus it's your focus but these are the things where i could kind of connect and, and find like, okay, that's, that's, that's a thing I make a note of. That's something I understand. That's another thing I, would, I could write about. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've listened and I've understood well over these days and there are a lot of words that keep coming up. Uh, we're talking about carbon fibers, smart plastics, um, end of life, circle economy, economy, of course, uh, recycling, 
Um, and I, I'm actually very happy to follow Jane's presentation because of course my words are community, co-production, co-creation, all of that uh, as a researcher myself, um, social researcher and as an artist are kind of the ways how I work and would love to see other organizations, people, I mean, everybody, scientists, especially, you know, the scientists that are here and the business people work as well. And, you know, I am in a position where before um, I was writing residence for, for Forestry England, I was a social scientist and a PhD student, so a PhD student in humanities. And, you know, we heard that my master's was looking at kind of Exxon Mobil and petroleum in Guyana. Right. And so there was a switch that happened last year when I turned into a writer. And I know that there are certain things I can say now that are much more accepted as a kind of artistic flow, as opposed to the opposite when it wasn't like that, um, when I was kind of talking as a scientist, a social scientist. So that is um, an idea that has helped me now to present to you what I'm going to show to you, because it might seem a little bit um, far fetched, but I'm going to show you, in fact, before, you know, at the point when I got the email from Haley and I said, look, that's it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not interested. I have no clue what this is about. The evening I went to when I was putting my son to sleep, uh, we, re we read a book and we read a book all the time and somehow something in my brain clicked about composites. Now it is 2D, it's flat, and I'm gonna show you images from a children's book, but I promise you it's the same images that I sent to Haley and Steve at the very beginning when I said, um, actually I might understand in a way. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and, okay. Um, you should be seeing my screen. Oops, sorry. Okay, so when I first found what this was, it was this book, a book called George Saves the World by Lunchtime. And the juxtaposition of, you know, a, a very real tape here, a very real helmet, a very real picture, photograph of glasses and um, milk bottles, that I understood what a composite was, at least in art, and very similar to what Jasmine was talking about doing actually with mycelium and substrates to make art, right? So, my, and it was my son who actually pointed it out. And it, we, it came into a thing where every single time we read this book now, we have to point out the real things, you know, things like the well is here, um, things like the washing machine, the light, uh, the, the switch here, um, the basket, it became a thing where we recognized that there was a, a composite happening of different things coming together, right? A very real, and it takes, it takes us much longer to read these books now because every single thing we must say, oh, look, this is a real photograph of um, grass. But I found the same thing in art, in, 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 you know, adult art, I suppose. This is Ida Mulune. She's uh, from Addis, right? Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And again, you, you wonder what's happening here because is this a painting? You know, is it a photograph? Is this broom real? Is this floor real? And for me, I know it's a very roundabout way, but it's, it's how I understood or could, could have understood, could have come to understand how in this conference, we're talking about composites and things that come together to create something that we need and possibly like, right? Because I like these photos and they're interesting because they make you think what medium was used to make it? Is it more than one? And you know, how, how what's the process behind it? Um, and so I tried to do a few of my own very simple things, but I think they have a bit of, um, they show a bit of, the ideas that I think you guys, well, I would, you know, I would ask you guys to be thinking about. Very simple, very different music, um, very small magazines, just cut out some of the first things that we found. And me and my son actually do this very regularly, you know, we make our own pictures. Um, but here, you know, Western en engineering and the global south. And, and we're talking about how is it that we can make these, um, how can they go together? Right, because there's nothing wrong with change as long as uh, the things that we want to retain are retained. There's nothing wrong with moving and, and kind of changing if, if it is going to help and if the tradition that people want to protect is protected. Um, and I think 
These are questions that industry have to be asking themselves right now in a world where we're talking about a climate crisis. So no matter who or what is working now has to be thinking about what world are we living um, and what, what can we give and how can we share, right? Um, knowledge, things that are again retained and old and things that are new and, and being born. What are we going to keep? What are we going to disseminate? You know, we have to, I think we have to be thinking about questions like this. And this is me just representing it in a, you know, flat two image, very artsy way. This is a funny one, but this also represents me, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, out in nature with children, this is what we do in the Green and Black project. But hey, when I go home or probably on the car ride, we're listening to the Tap Forget tunes, right? Because it's just uh, talking again about culture um, and, 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 and how we're gonna keep everyone interested in what, we, in what we're doing. Now, um, so what I think I'm, I'm running off on my time, I think so at the at the end of this event, you know, and, and again, this is just me thinking in 2D, but I think there's so many sensory ways to think about it. And I'm going to write, uh, going to come away from the conference and workshops and write what a, a bit of a provocation and what I think about sustainable composites um, and, you know, possibly putting that idea or putting some ideas there into the, the mainstream um environmental justice and environmental thought and nature rights in a um, movement and also um and then also again having my artistic kind of representation of it that might help the people who we want to uh, take part in our co-production and our community and our co-creation how is it that we can have a bridge and they might be able to grasp some of the concepts. And I see it in 2D, Jazz saw it in 3D with mycelium, which again, I have no clue. Um, but when I, when I see, or when I see a, a presentation about um, an airplane blade made from wood and bioplastic and carbon, fiber, again, that makes sense when I know what the final product is, right? So for me, um, it's been great. I, I still understand a lot, but I think there are ways that the bridge must be built and, and we can do it. You know, we can do it because it, as much as it's business and industry, I have to say it, 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 it's for everyday life, right? Everything at some point we need, we're doing it for a reason and it's for people to kind of continue living. Um, and so we protect a lot of the places that are in the global south that we get our resources from, um, but also know that industry and movement can happen. We just need coming together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zakir. Um, okay, so um, we've got some time for questions. Has, has anybody got any questions they would like to ask Zakir? If not, I can also um, actually read a bit. I forgot I was supposed to read a bit, but I think, have I gone oh. over my time? <laughs> no, not at all, no. Um, well, we've got plenty of time. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, somebody's just saying that was very interesting and thank you. Um, and I found it very interesting too. Um, in, in, in art, um, is there a, is there, do you, have you ever found any examples of, of, of composites or is this something we could do? We could make a, make a, a piece of art based on, on composites. I mean, a lot of our composites, you might've, might've figured are quite sort of, um, lifeless they're a bit sort of you know they don't really have much life but is there any way to sort of bring that alive in art i don't know that was my question i mean you know i think what's interesting is we're talking about material and, and the material for sure can be used in art right um then you might have different discussions about um you know i think exactly a year ago i was at a, a little you know community workshop and there was a a, a young man who was creating bioplastics. And this was a, and I can't remember what he was using. It was something very simple like eggs or something that he was mixing particles that we were uh, recycling. We, we were making things right there. And I think those are ways that are creative and artistic and, and it brings things to a community level and to a different world, which is the art world or, or the DIY world. Um, and, you know, uh, there have to be those connections or else it remains this thing that is you can't even google and find on the first page what it really is about i mean no there is because there this conference has happened and so you can breed um from a point of view you know again though it's another uh, academy 
right? It's the it's just, it's universities, but it's at least we're reading from uh, a place that's studying it and it's not necessarily a business. Not that there's anything wrong with a business, but we want kind of a uh, you know a, an unbiased opinion. And I think art can do that in ways. Of course, the art is biased because of who makes it, but it gives another opinion, another way to look at it that you might recognize something else. You know, so in that way, I think yes, and and we have to like we have to because of where we are at right now with 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 climate change and and the problems in uh, with exploitation in the global south and at home. Like we're not forgetting about inequalities at home. I think we have to scientists have to start doing that and bridging it both ways. It's not just scientists. It just so happens that scientists often have the authority um, and the clout and the kind of, you know, the, the, the things behind them to do it. Uh, so we have to, we have to kind of have make power say, look, we are accepting and willing to learn or try through these avenues. Okay, so a question um, here, you mentioned uh, your own challenge with understanding what composite sustainability is, but what you've got the audience now, what could this community do to help uh, encourage greater awareness of the huge potential to make a difference, as well as the challenges that face these materials? What, what do you think we could do? Well, I mean, this is probably a good place where the, the Global South and kind of people working in the Global South and in the environment where probably these resources come from could be really helpful. Um, because if they know these resources in their very first point, so at the end, at, you know, for, if we're talking about end to end and they know it from its, from the point where it's just growing or it is just becoming, um, or it's just collected, I think then absolutely that's a, a the, the, these are people that have an interest already. And this is what I'm talking about. It's interest from different angles. So in one way, this is kind of a group or people, um, you know, just because of their proximity to the resource or you know whatever it is that they have that connects them to it that possibly help on the other end in kind of getting the idea out there and I think you know we have to remember that environmentalism too in you know environmentalism in England is very different from environmentalism in Jamaica where I grew up right um, I was born in one country but I grew up in the other one and I can tell you they're very the ideas are are very different things that are considered very nice and environmentally friendly here people might not people would be, do it and not and and just not consider that it has anything to do with you know their their ability to make the world a better place they kind of just do it for financial reasons or because the resource is there you know so again it's also looking um at how other people see things and 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 um allowing them to be experts in a way because you guys are always going to be the experts right on, on the industry end and on the teaching end about it but they, they have to be kind of see seen experts in other uh dimensions and i think you know this com this conference does it actually by putting me in this position because it's intimidating for me for me to be speaking to you guys who are at the top of the industry, of course. But, um, you know, I found it, again, I found it um, great because it's made me think of uh, art. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I could talk to you all afternoon. Um, but I, I, unfortunately, we're running late for our workshop, I've just been informed. So I, I have, we have to finish this session now, but let's continue this conversation uh, going forwards. And it's been lovely to have you. So thank you very much for your insights and uh, it's been really appreciated. But um, to all the participants who are still with us online, um, we are gonna now move over to the workshop. So that's a separate link, in uh, a separate Zoom link. So those of you that have registered to go to the workshop, um, we, we, if you could now just take yourself over to there and we'll see you there shortly. Thank you.